The presidential election of 1912 was a battle between heavyweights. The campaign of 1912, I think, is the greatest presidential election we've ever had because you had such interesting, colorful candidates. The incumbent was Republican William Howard Taft. The Democratic challenger, tall and dignified Woodrow Wilson. And taking them both on was the most formidable third-party candidate in history, former Republican president Theodore Roosevelt. Disappointed that his hand-picked successor Taft had abandoned many of his policies, Roosevelt had actually tried to wrest the Republican nomination away from him. He failed, and at that point could have chosen to bow out gracefully. But this was Teddy Roosevelt. He said, I stand at Armageddon to do battle for the Lord. Running under the banner of the new Progressive Party, the popular Roosevelt capsized Taft's re-election bid. But TR's candidacy had an unintended consequence. By splitting the Republican vote, he allowed the Democrat, Wilson, to win the White House. Number 28, Woodrow Wilson, Democrat, 1913 to 1921, 56 years old, from New Jersey. Woodrow Wilson is neither fondly remembered or very well understood by most Americans today. However, he occupies a secure position in that exclusive pantheon of great presidents. A southerner by birth, Thomas Woodrow Wilson was an academic, the only president to hold a PhD. He served as president of Princeton University from 1902 until 1910, when he left to become governor of New Jersey. That would be his only elected office before he became president of the United States. Wilson was a thoughtful, religious man, an avid golfer. He enjoyed movies and vaudeville shows. Publicly, he was perceived as a human machine, cold and academically methodical about his decision-making. Privately, at home, he could be quite charming, rather funny. He liked to sing songs from Broadway shows of that time. But that was very much the private Wilson. The public Wilson was seemed often to most people rather cold. He was not a person that people often warmed up to. Wilson's most important political asset was his skill with the spoken word, and he wasn't afraid to use it. He was the first president since John Adams to deliver his State of the Union messages to Congress in person. When he became president, Wilson tried to bring a bit of the ivory tower to the Oval Office. Wilson was a collegial leader. He's been a college president, that makes sense. Uh, they said in cabinet meetings he wasn't the boss. It was more like the first among equals, and they would discuss things very freely. In his first term, Wilson focused on fulfilling the progressive domestic agenda he called the New Freedom. One of his enduring contributions was to create the Federal Reserve to manage the U.S. currency system. It was one of the remarkable successes of Wilson's administration. It has persisted since 1913, and it has done a remarkably good job of maintaining the stability of the American currency. In the summer of 1914, Woodrow Wilson faced two great crises. Just as the guns of August signaled the start of World War I in Europe, the president's wife, Ellen, died of a kidney ailment. Ellen Wilson died. And Wilson was heard to whisper, my God, what am I going to do? As he privately mourned his wife, Wilson was faced with an increasingly difficult public dilemma. Most Americans wanted nothing to do with the great war in Europe, so Wilson pledged neutrality. But that was problematic, especially with German submarines targeting British passenger ships that often carried American civilians across the Atlantic. In one incident, the sinking of the Lusitania in 1915, 128 Americans were killed. Despite public outrage over the Lusitania, most Americans wanted Wilson to keep his head, which he did, and save him from Europe's awful mess. They simply did not think that this was America's fight. In 1915, 17 months after his wife died, Wilson remarried. His bride was a Washington widow named Edith Bowling Galt. The following year, he was narrowly re-elected as president, making him the first Democratic incumbent to win re-election since Andrew Jackson in 1832. 
With Germany declaring early in 1917 that American shipping would no longer be spared the wrath of submarine warfare, it would be a challenging second term for the domestic-minded president. Wilson marked to a friend, it would be an irony of fate if my administration were consumed by foreign affairs. Well, it was, of course, a tragic irony of fate, but of course that is exactly what happens by the second administration. On April 2, 1917, Wilson asked Congress for a declaration of war against Germany. In this famous war message, he minted what would become an enduring theme in American foreign policy. The world must be made safe for democracy. I shall bring peace and safety to all nations and make the world itself at last free. That's how he ended the speech. It was really one of the great speeches in American history. From the beginning of America's involvement in the war, Wilson was focused on his vision for the peace. And central to that vision was his idea for the League of Nations, an international body that could settle disputes without bloodshed and bring an end to war. The League would become his great obsession. As a war president, Wilson mostly kept his hands off and let U.S. Army General John Blackjack Pershing take care of the details. John J. Pershing said that uh, Woodrow Wilson gave him only one order, maintain a separate American army. Wilson had brought the United States into the war late and for our own reasons. And one of the ways to make sure that we emphasized how separate our commitment to the war was, was to keep a separate army. The first family aided the war effort by grazing sheep on the White House lawn and auctioning off the wool to raise money for the Red Cross. But the man who sought to make the world safe for democracy turned a blind eye to democratic suppression at home when Congress passed the Sedition and Espionage Acts of 1918, which made it a crime to criticize the government. Wilson really did not set this in motion in a direct way, but he acquiesced in the suppression of fundamental civil liberties for the duration of the war. Overseas, the arrival of the American army proved decisive for the Allies. 19 months after Wilson declared war, Germany surrendered. The final terms of the peace would be decided at a conference in Paris. Although no sitting U.S. president had ever traveled to Europe, there was no question that Woodrow Wilson would make the trip. He set sail for France on December 4, 1918 carrying with him the hopes of the world for a peace that would last for all time. He was greeted rapturously. He was regarded as the embodiment of this fresh new force from the other side of the Atlantic that had brought this horrible bloody conflict to an end. He went to Paris, to London, to Rome, children threw roses at his feet. Millions of people turned out to see him. He was the, the hero, the savior out of the West. Wilson had to make many compromises in Paris, but when the treaty was finally signed at the Palace of Versailles, he had gotten what he wanted most, a provision for the establishment of the League of Nations. Still, as he sailed for home, there was one stumbling block remaining approval by the Republican-controlled U.S. Senate. In Washington, Wilson faced vehement opposition from Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, the powerful Republican chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. When Wilson came home from Paris, he insisted on hand-delivering the treaty to the Senate. And when he got to the Senate door, Henry Cabot Lodge asked Wilson if he could carry in the treaty. And Wilson turned to Lodge and said, not on your life, Senator. Refusing to negotiate with the Senate, Wilson sought to rally public opinion for the treaty. To do so, he set out on a physically demanding cross-country speaking tour. He never listened to his doctor who kept saying, take it easy on this trip. Don't strain yourself. He insisted on doing it. He was in Pueblo, Colorado. He suddenly was overcome. It was a physical collapse at that point and he had to curtail his barnstorming around the country, returned to Washington, where he suffered a severe stroke. Wilson really was seriously impaired by that stroke. Uh, from October 1919 till March 1921,
um, the United States really didn't have much of a chief executive in Woodrow Wilson. Edith Wilson was fiercely protective of her husband. She kept most visitors away and tried to cover up the severity of his condition. She also took it upon herself to relay important matters of state to the president and report back on what Wilson was thinking. For the 18 months remaining in the presidency, one could almost say that indeed Mrs. Wilson was a kind of president. It was an extraordinary moment in American history. Wilson's illness clearly, clearly contributed to the political gridlock that spread over the Capitol at this terribly crucial moment with the League and the Treaty at stake. On March 19, 1920, the ailing president was informed that the treaty, and therefore the League of Nations, had met its final defeat in the Senate. He replied, they have shamed us in the eyes of the world. Wilson's failure to compromise had far-reaching implications. Without U.S. support, the League of Nations proved ineffective, setting the stage for another generation to fight another world war. I happen to think if Wilson had been healthy, he would have given enough ground so that the Senate would have had to go along with the Treaty of Versailles. The United States would have joined the League of Nations, and the course of world history over the next 20 years might have been materially different. Despite his failure to get the treaty ratified, Woodrow Wilson had succeeded in laying the cornerstone for a new relationship between America and the world. That idea of what the proper role of the United States vis-a-vis -vis the world ought to be, Wilson really is the first president to grapple with that whole set of problems and ideas. And, you know, we're still trying to sort that out today. Woodrow Wilson appeared on the $100,000 bill, the largest American denomination ever printed. Never circulated, it was only used by the Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department.